Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we serve you with gladness and we come into your presence with praise. As your word is preached on this morning, help us to do our duty as a Christian ought and help us to spread love's message as the master taught. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin, I would like to thank Brother Shannon for preaching and teaching all the classes on last week in my absence. You all were missed. And I also would like to thank Brother Stephen for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from the book of Matthew, The chapter is 2, and the verses are 13 through 15, in which we're going to speak from the subject on this morning, out of Egypt, out of Egypt. Now, the book of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It was written by the Apostle Matthew. This book is also known as the Gospel according to Matthew. It is one of four gospel accounts and is identified as one of the three synoptic gospels. Now, when we look at the book of Matthew, we recognize that Matthew's book focuses on Jesus as the supreme teacher as well as the promised Messiah. It climaxes with the great commission that was given by Jesus to his apostles that was to be carried out until Jesus comes again. Now, what makes Matthew's gospel account unique are at least four things that I've discovered which will lead us into our scriptural text on this morning. Number one, Matthew gives a genealogy or the genealogy of Jesus, if you will, but he accentuates uh, women that might otherwise remain hidden. So this is something that Matthew does that Luke doesn't do. Some of the things that he does in his genealogy is that Jesus' mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, was pregnant with Jesus, but not by her husband, Joseph. That's something that when you are talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords, you might want to remain hidden. Nevertheless, this was a fulfillment of prophecy that a child will be born of a virgin and his name shall be called Emmanuel, according to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Another woman that is identified in the genealogy of Jesus is a woman that we know as Bathsheba. Even though she is not called Bathsheba in Matthew's genealogy, she is simply identified as the wife of Uriah. We see that this woman was married to King David, but only after uh, she committed adultery with David, was found with child, and her husband Uriah was killed by the king in order to cover up the affair. We also read of another woman that is identified in the lineage of Jesus, and that's a woman by the name of Ruth. This Ruth was married to Boaz, and she was considered an outcast, for she was a Moabitess. What that simply means is that her nation and heritage is the product of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. Another woman is brought up in the lineage, in the genealogy, of Jesus, and that is the woman Rahab. Rahab married into the covenant, but only after she made her living selling her body sexually for monetary gain. Another woman that is identified in the lineage and the genealogy of Jesus is a woman by the name of Tamar. The Bible tells us that Tamar played the harlot and was almost burned at the stake until she revealed that her father-in-law Judah was also the father of of her twin boys. Another thing that Matthew does in his gospel account is that he shared his own conversion to Christ in this gospel by using his Greek name and not his, by using his Greek name, his Gentile name, and not his Hebrew name. Now, you would think that someone who has written a gospel account for the purposes of trying to convince the Jewish people that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he is the promised Messiah, that he would talk about himself in his Jewish name 
coming to Christ. But he wanted to emphasize that the coming Messiah not only came for the Jewish people, but he also came for all people. And so therefore, he uses his Greek name, which is Matthew, and not his Hebrew name, which is Levi. And the fourth thing that he does in this gospel account is that 12 times does Matthew points to Christ fulfilling a specific Old Testament prophecy to prove to his readers that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And this is what brings us to our scriptural text, because when we read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 15 uh, through 17, but rather Matthew chapter, thir- chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, we need to recognize that when we read this gospel account, that wasn't something that just happened. It just wasn't something in which Jesus was in Bethlehem, went to Egypt, and just happened to come back to Nazareth, and that's just some event that just happened by happenstance. No, we need to recognize that this happening was a fulfillment of prophecy. And it was the fulfillment of a messianic prophecy that we read about in Hosea chapter 11. And the verse is one. The Bible makes clear that Jesus had to go to Egypt in order for God to call his son out of Egypt and fulfill this prophecy. Yet when we look at Matthew chapter 2, this is not the first, nor is it the last time that we see God calling Christ out of Egypt. So what I want us to do on today is I want us to hear God's word through the medium. And the medium that we're going to hear his word through is through the subject of typology, the study of typology. That is dealing with the study of types, and anti-types in scripture that makes real to us what it is that we are supposed to get out of this text on this morning. PowerPoint number one, we're going to start with the hype. The hype. And the hype is found in Genesis chapter 12 in the verses 20. In Genesis chapter 12 in the verses 20, this is the first time we see Jesus being called out of Egypt. And he does it in the person of Abraham. Listen to your Bible, in which the Bible reads, and Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. The hype, we're talking about how God called Christ out of Egypt in Abraham. Now by hype, what are we talking about? We are speaking about promotion. When someone hypes you up, that means that they are promoting you. They are advertising you. They are building you up to be something big and important. And we see Christ being hyped up in Abraham. Christ was promoted. He was advertised in Abraham when God gave Abraham the promise that he gave him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, the Bible reads, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now when we look at this promise in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, in that promise we see that God made three promises to Abraham. He, one, made a land promise to Abraham, He made a nation promise to Abraham, and he made a seed or a spiritual promise to Abraham. The land promise was Canaan, and we see the children of Israel going into the promised land. We see that the nation promise was Israel, because at the time Abram received this promise, he had no children. But God blessed him and his wife in their old age 
to be blessed with a child by the name of Isaac, and Isaac gave birth to Esau and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. From Israel came his 12 sons, which were known as the patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel, and from there a nation was born. And we also see the seed promise. And the seed promise is told to us that that promise was Jesus Christ, for it extends spiritually. Listen to your Bible as we take a look at Galatians chapter 3 and the verses 16. In Galatians chapter 3 and the verses 16, that's in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible reads, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Paul says it does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This promise was reiterated to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, and was used in the sermon preached by the apostle Peter after he healed a man who had been lame from birth in Acts chapter 3 in the verses 25. So after God told Abraham to get out of his country in Genesis chapter 12, the Bible tells us that a famine hit the land, and Abraham found himself where? He found himself in Egypt, according to Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 16. And once Abraham was in Egypt, God afflicted Pharaoh in his dreams, and he demanded that Abraham leave the land of Egypt, according to Genesis chapter 12, verses 17 through 20. So what we see as a result of prophecy and the fulfillment of this prophecy and the things that the New Testament writer says about the promise of Abraham and Christ, we recognize that Christ was in Abraham and God called him out of Egypt through the affliction of Pharaoh. But we also read about Christ coming out of Egypt another way. And we read about that in the Messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ in Hosea chapter 11. And the verse is 1. In Hosea chapter 11. And the verse is 1. In Hosea chapter 11. And the verse is 1. The prophet writes, When Israel was a child. I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So if PowerPoint number one was the hype, then PowerPoint number two is the type. And the type is that God called Christ out of Egypt in Israel. Now by type, we are speaking about a shadow something said or seen that gives evidence of something real approaching. Let me give that definition again. By type, we are talking about a shadow, something that is said or something that is seen that gives evidence of something real approaching. If I am walking around the corner, you may not see me, but you may see my shadow to let you know that something made that shadow. And that shadow is a reflection of something that is approaching. And so what we see in Hosea is the shadow, which was the something seen and the something heard to point to the fact that Jesus was approaching. Hosea's messianic prophecy in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 is the something said. And Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage in Exodus chapter 14 is the something seen that gives evidence of the coming Christ. You know the story 
of Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage is summarized in Psalm 105, verses 12 through 38. The event of them being delivered out of the Egyptian bondage is celebrated in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also known as the Passover. That we read about its institution in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13. And we read about its rules and its celebration in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. We see that inspired preachers of the New Testament spoke of Jesus Christ being with Israel during the Exodus. The Apostle Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 4 and 5, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. And even Jesus' own brother Jude speaks of him being there at that time in Jude 5. Don't you know in Acts chapter 7, Stephen speaks of the patriarch's jealousy of Joseph that sent him to Egypt in the first place. In his sermon, he talks about a famine that caused the rest of the family to leave the land of Canaan to actually come to Egypt for relief. And Stephen tells of the 400 years of enslavement that Israel suffered at the hands of Pharaoh. And once in Egypt, God, through his servant Moses, afflicted Pharaoh with plagues, and Pharaoh had no choice but to let Israel go. So we see in this text that Christ was in Israel and God called them out of Egypt through signs and wonders. We see that God called Christ out of Egypt in Abraham. That was the hype. God called Christ out of Egypt in Israel. That was the type. Now we need to go to our scriptural text of Matthew chapter 2. Verse 15, which is the anti-type. Again, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible reads, And remained there until the death of Herod, that this was fulfilled, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. The anti-type is actually God calling Christ out of Egypt, not figuratively, but literally, that means the physical Jesus left Bethlehem, found himself in Egypt, and after Herod died, God called Christ literally out of Egypt. And that was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, by antitype, we are speaking about the reality that the type represented. Just like Israel came out of Egyptian bondage, just like Abraham came out of Egypt, and just like uh, Israel was called out of Egypt in the book of Hosea, we see that Christ is the reality of those shadows represented in this text. Don't you know that Abraham and Joseph went to Egypt? The Bible tells us that Christ also went to Egypt. Abraham and Israel were called out of Egypt, and Christ too was called out of Egypt. Pharaoh wanted to kill all the male Hebrew children two years and under during the days of Moses, and we see that Herod wanted to kill all the male children two years and under during the days of Christ. But I also want us to see that God protected Moses while in Egypt. And we see that our Heavenly Father also protected Christ while in Egypt. My brothers and sisters, if we get nothing else out of this narrative, then please know that if God has the authority to send us into a place, then he also has the power to call us out of that same place, regardless of the efforts of the enemy. We see that Christ was called out of Egypt to fulfill messianic prophecy. And I want to close on this morning by giving our fourth type, and that is the stereotype. 
We read about the hype. The hype was Abraham. We read about the type, the Messianic prophecy given in Hosea. We read about the anti-type, who was Jesus, in Matthew chapter 2. And now I want us to take a look at the stereotype. The stereotype is found in Revelation chapter 11, and the verse is 8. Revelation, the chapter is 11, and the verse is 8. The Bible reads, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. The stereotype is this that God has called Christ out of Egypt in us. This is the application of today's message, that God called Christ out of Egypt in us. Now, by stereotype, we are speaking about an idea that is held as standard. Now, I understand that the term stereotype has become a very bad word among many circles because certain stereotypes have created negative prejudices that are just aren't true. Nevertheless, the Bible uses a stereotype that makes abundantly clear our need for a Savior. Listen to your Bible as we go to Romans chapter 3, and the verse is 23. In Romans chapter 3, in the verses 23, a very familiar passage of Scripture, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. My brothers and sisters, we can look at any person, and any person can look at us, use the term sinner to describe us, and they wouldn't even be lying. They will actually be telling the truth. What have they done? They stereotyped us, but it's a stereotype that's true because the Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't you know that the Apostle Paul himself understood this when he said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, the sin is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He didn't say I was the foremost. He didn't say back in the day I used to be among the sinners. He said, no, of I am of the foremost. He still recognized himself even as an apostle, even as a preacher, even as a follower of Jesus Christ. He never forgot the fact that Jesus came because of the type of person he was and still is, and he needed Jesus every day of his life to help him with his daily struggles. And this is what we need to understand as well. Since sin entered the world, we have found ourselves in symbolic Egypt, known as the afflicting bondage of darkness. But isn't it good to know that Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, is still in the Bible? When we look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, the Bible reads, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also enjoy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In other words, what the Bible is telling us here is that while we were still 
in Egypt. God called us out by the death of Christ so that a holy relationship with God may be restored. And I want you to know on this morning that God is still in the calling business. God is calling us out of Egypt today. So the question we need to ask ourselves on this morning is this, where do we stand? If we are in Christ, but have found ourselves back in bondage, then what you need to do on this morning is simply confess your faults, repent of your sins, and ask for prayers that you may be forgiven. According to Acts chapter 8, verse 22 through 24, James chapter 5, verse 16, and 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Please let the blood of Jesus be applied to your soul so that the shackles of sin may be broken by cleansing you from all unrighteousness. But maybe, my friends, you are not in Christ Jesus on this morning then you have heard the hype, and it's real. You've heard the type, it happened. You heard the anti-type, Jesus came, bled, and died for you. And you heard the stereotype, that we need Jesus to make our wrongs right on today. Believe the seriousness of your situation, and believe in the reality of Christ. Cease the sinful behavior that is separating you from a holy God. Acknowledge the Christ who died for you and be immersed in the Red Sea known as baptism and come out of Egypt while you still have time. Wherever you are on this morning, we ask that you make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.